Good morning, church. Good morning. Amen. Praise God. God is good. All the time, God is good. Amen. Have I told you lately that I love you? No. <laughs> so I love you all. Muama chup chup. I always say that. All right. So uh, this morning we are in our concluding part of the uh, the parable of the loving father or the parable of the prodigal son. And uh, this morning we will be discussing about the older son. What are the lessons that uh, we could get from this older son? Now, we now go to the next scene in the parable of the loving father. And we will start our uh, scene in verses 25 to 27 in Luke chapter 15. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And as he approached the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what was going on. Your brother has returned, he said, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he, he has him back safe <clears throat> and sound. So upon learning what was going on in their house, now was this son happy? No, he was not. Okay. In fact, he was angry. Okay. Now verse 28 tells us the older son became angry and he refused to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. Now, this verses sets the scene, uh, the dialogue between the father and this older son. And um, last week I mentioned about some of the uh, uh, the culture, the tradition, you know. And let me uh, again point out some of the cultures involved in this uh, in this scene. Now we have here the firstborn the older son and uh, we know that the firstborn during that time would have what they call the birthright right so the firstborn son would play an important role in the service to god now amongst the siblings the firstborn son is expected to be serving god thus leading an example to his other uh, siblings well of course the other siblings will eventually uh, and are expected to serve god as well now the second, the firstborn son will play also an important role in their society as he will be uh, the future patriarch of the family. Okay? Not only he would serve God, but he would also serve uh, the community in a rightful manner that would properly represent their family. Now the third, the firstborn son is entitled to receive a double portion of the estate of the, the father. Okay. Now, while the father is still alive, the firstborn son, his duty is to uphold the honor and the integrity of the family. All right. So all eyes are upon this firstborn son. And a lot of things uh, fall on the shoulder of this firstborn son. And... Uh, with the feast given by his father to the younger, the younger son, the younger brother, it was also uh, customary for this older brother to be present okay, in, in that feast. With this older brother's refusal to go in and celebrate with the father and his younger brother, um, it was, in a way, he was... Uh, uh, the way he acted towards his father um, and to this holy bent, he was putting a bad impression upon, uh, upon the family, upon the father. Okay. Again, it was customary for him to join in the festivities. Now, my next question would be, to whom this older son was angry? Was he angry at his younger brother, or was he angry at his father? So the answer is he was angry at his father. Well, of course, 
uh, maybe he was also a bit angry with his uh, younger brother for um, having, uh, having them, uh, leaving them and satisfying his own desire, taking his uh, share of the estate, squandering everything, you know. And then uh, when he lost everything, this younger brother had the audacity to return back. So probably he was, uh, he was a bit angry uh, with the attitude of his younger brother. But his anger was actually focused on the father. Now the words of the son say it all why he was angry at his father. In Luke chapter 15, 29 to 30. But he answered his father, look, all these years, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed a, command, a commandment of yours. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, now you can see the wordings, when this son of yours returns from squandering your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. So we can easily see and feel the anger of this son to the father, and we could easily see the jealousy of this uh, older brother to his younger brother. Okay? the way his father treated the younger brother. Now, some might even go with the sentiments, with the sentiment of the, uh, with the older son for, you know, for he was, some would say that he, he was right, Brother Mike. I felt that he was right to be angry at his, at his father, you know, because he stayed loyal to his father, worked uh, hard all his life <clears throat> for his father, and not a, a single recognition was ever given to him. Not like his younger brother who squandered everything and who did the exact opposite. All right. So some may go with the sentiment of this older brother. And uh, the fact of the matter is, not only this younger brother given a robe, he was given the best robe. And he was also given a feast while this older brother was not given anything. Okay? And we might say, yeah, uh, it was just right for the older brother to be jealous and get mad at his father and, and you know, be jealous with his, with his brother because his father showed favoritism. Now, we might go to that extent. Now, this was exactly what was going on and what was in the mind of this older brother. Now, in verse 29 again, the sentiment of the older brother, yet you never gave me even a young goat. You gave my brother a robe, not just an ordinary robe, but you gave him the best robe. You even gave him a ring. You even gave him sandals. And you even had a fist for him. But I was working so hard and be, being obedient to you, yet you never gave me even a young goat. Now, he thought that his father was unfair. He thought that his father was unappreciative of him. Worst, in the reasoning of the son, we found out that his obedience to his father was a merit-based relationship and not a love-based relationship. Okay. So all along, he was doing it for the reward. You see, the word that was used was, I've been slaving for you. All my life, I've been slaving for you. So the motivation for the relationship of the son to his father was more of obligatory rather than out of love. It was more of a duty service rather than an affectionate type of service. Now, with all this said, these were the faults, these were the flaws in the thinking, in the mind of the son. The son never understood his father's action, and he just doesn't get it. Now, this points me back 
to an Old Testament character in Jonah. Okay, I know you remember Jonah in the Old Testament. Now, the story started in Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. The story started out when the word of the Lord came to Jonah, uh, saying, Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh, and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Now, Jonah, instead of going to Nineveh, Jonah runs away from the Lord. He, he went and boarded a ship, and there was a great storm, and he was thrown out to the sea, and a great fish uh, swallowed him. After three days and uh, three nights inside the belly, he was uh, vomited by the fish. And then finally, the Lord met him again, and finally he went to Nineveh. He proclaimed the message of God. The people repented, and God did not destroy the city of Nineveh. Now, in chapter 4, Jonah was displeased, and he became angry. Jonah, however, was greatly displeased and became angry. So he prayed to the Lord, saying, Oh, Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own country? This is why I was so quick to flee toward Tarshish. I know that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, loving devotion, one who relents from sending disaster. So Jonah, he was angry because God had mercy on the people of Nineveh. All right. So the question is, why is uh, Jonah, or why was Jonah want to see Nineveh destroyed? Okay. Why? Now, for one, uh, the Assyrians, okay, Nineveh is the capital city of Assyria. So the Assyrians treated the Israelites very harshly. So somehow, uh, the downfall of the capital of Assyria, which is Nineveh, would mean a victory for the Israelites. And it would also be a sweet justice that probably Jonah wanted to see. So that's why he wanted to see the destruction of Nineveh. Okay, But the Lord had mercy on these people. Now, as the story unfolded, while Jonah was watching from afar, he sat down and there was a plant. Okay, there was a plant all of a sudden appeared that God made that plant appear and uh, became a shelter for Jonah. And all, all of a sudden, there was a worm that eats the plant and the plant withered. And Jonah was angry again. He was so angry for he cared for the plant. Okay? Then God asked Jonah, Have you any right to be angry about the plant? I do, replied Jonah. I am angry enough to die. But the Lord said, You cared about the plant, which neither tended nor made grow. It sprang up a night and perished in a night. So should I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and many cattle as well? Now, I do believe that these words from God say it all. The older son, all his life, he was with his father. And all those years that he was with his father, he never really knew his father's character. That his father was a very loving and a very caring father. All his life, he was with his father, but he never saw that. Okay. If he just loved his father enough and just paid attention on how his father cared for their servants, he should have known that his father was truly a loving, forgiving, and caring father. But he was so busy thinking about himself. You know, his father would have treated him being a son more than the servants. Okay, him being the son, his father would have treated him more than their servants. 
and given him good things if he just asked. The principle behind Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. And you see, in the story, this older son never asked anything from his father. And if he asked for something from his father, I do believe that his father would give him a goat for him and for his friends to enjoy. The principle behind Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Now, we have two sons, the, the younger and the older son. Okay? One who went away, he lived his life squandering everything he had, and he lived a wild life. The Bible tells us wild living. A bad son to most of the standards, to most of our standards. He was, this younger son was typically a bad son, a bad apple. Now we have, on the other hand, we have another son who stayed with his father, worked hard and obeyed his father. A typical good son that we might call, not a bad apple, a good apple, as we would say. Yet, by studying clearly, okay, both of them, both were actually alienated from the father. Okay. The younger son was alienated from the father for he went away. Literally, he went away. Okay. So he was alienated from his father. So the older brother, though he stayed with his father, he was alienated from his father emotionally and by affection. He was living with his father, but his heart was not with his father. So actually, we have two lost sons. Okay. On different occasions, the father went out to both of them. Remember, the father went out to his first son when he saw from afar his first son. He ran towards the first son. And the second son, when the second son was coming, he stopped from a distance, and the father went towards him, and he pleaded to him. So the father, in both sons, he went out, okay, and because both, both two sons were alienated from him. The father invited them both, Okay. The younger son okay, to his home, back to his home, and the older son to the feast to celebrate the joy and to celebrate in welcoming okay, this, uh, his younger brother. Now, for the father, it was an invitation by love and joy. So now, the younger son heeded the invitation. He went back home with his father, while the older son did not, and he stayed out. In the story, we thought we only have one lost son. But if we would really read and understand, we have two lost sons. Love is the very foundation of the Christian faith. For he that authored faith is love. For God is love. Let me expound. In John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. It is because of the love of God towards us that he gave his only begotten son to die on the cross for all of us. Then it goes on to say that whoever believes in him should not perish. Believe in him, and that is faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. It is because of our knowledge of this love of God towards us that we learn that you and I, we are all sinners. And as sinners, we fall short of the glory of God. And as we fall short of the glory of God, we are supposed to, we are bound to eternal punishment. But 
But this love of God towards us in John 3.16 pointed us to Jesus and led us to Jesus to have faith in him. So that's why love is the foundation of our faith. All belief systems, for that matter, hinge on love. Every ideology that you have teaches the concept and principle of love. Every one of us, every one of us who call ourselves servants of the Lord and those who would embrace God and would embrace Christianity, love must be the basis of our Christian faith. It must be love. My question now would be, love for whom? Love for whom? First and foremost, to God. The greatest command tells us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. With all your mind. You see, heart, soul, and mind, it represents the fullness. It represents the fullness of our existence. Our emotions, our heart, our intellect, our mind, and our soul, our spirit. And love must also be the basis of our obedience to God. It must not be onerous. It must not be obligatory. Just like the relationship of this older son to his father, which was a merit-based type of relationship. It was more of obligation rather than love it was more of a uh, uh, a honorable service rather than affection service to the lord and to his to his father so our true love for god must be upon love rooted upon love if it is not love then you have to go back to your faith you have to go back to that love of yours and examine yourself if you truly love the Lord while serving the Lord. And our true love for God must be exhibited and it should, it, it should be exhibited okay, through our obedience to his command. And one of his command tells us in 2239 of Matthew, love your neighbor as yourself. Therefore, it is paramount for all of us to love one another, to love each other. And this is what the older son misses. He misses the point because he was serving his father not out of love, but because out of merit. That's why he misses the point of love. That's why when his father came to him and asked him to celebrate with him because his younger brother had returned, he misses the point of love. Because his obedience was not based on love. He misses the point of the second command of God to love your neighbor as yourself. And the father's relationship with both of them was always based on love. And it was not based on their obedience to him. It was always based on love. Whether they were obedient or not, their father's love for them was always there. And because of that love, this father loved his younger son, despite what his younger son did, despite the sins of this younger son. He loved him because he loved him. And that's what matters to him. If love was the motivation of the older son for his obedience to his father, he would have, you know, he would have loved his brother as well. And in loving his brother, he would have obeyed the second command of the Lord. Commanding him to love his, his, uh, to love your neighbor as yourself. Love, second is forgiveness. Forgiveness. Love and forgiveness, they are two integral part of a Christian life. Let me explain. Love, it is an invisible emotion. Let me repeat. Love is an invisible emotion. You cannot see love per se. You cannot see it. It must be manifested in ways that it could be seen, 
and it could be felt. Okay? When God said, I love you, did you feel it? Yes. When God said, I love you, did you see it? Yes. Was it by words only? No. Was it manifested? Yes, it was manifested. John 3.16. We go back to John 3.16. God said, I love you. My first question was, did you see it? Yes. John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Did you feel it? Yes, of course. Was it manifested? Yes, it was manifested. God's love was seen. God's love was felt. God's love was manifested through the death of his only son, Jesus Christ. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, the Bible tells us, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue. You know, not just by speech. Do not just talk about love. Show it. Now, it tells us, but in deed and in truth. In truth. Show it by your actions. Show it by your actions and show it in truth. Meaning, not in any hypocritical way, because a genuine love demands the sincerity of our hearts, for God can see right through your hearts. He can see if you are sincere in loving one another or not. So that's why John tells us, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And if you go back to John 3.16, God did not love us by just words. It was shown, manifested through his only son, <clears throat> Jesus Christ. Love <clears throat> is the driving force behind forgiveness. Forgiveness, on the other hand, it is the manifestation of love. It what gives love its substance, its form, its body, so that it can be seen, that enables us to see and feel this emotion called love. That's why I said a while ago, love per se, it is invisible. For us to see love, for you to see that you are love, that you love your fellow, you must show it. It must be felt. It must be manifested. Now, there are people who are like this older brother or older son who doesn't know how to forgive. When you don't know how to forgive, you really don't know how to love as well. Okay? Now, when Jesus said, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? Now, but we say, oh, Brother Mike, that is love. How about forgiveness? Now, the following, in the following chapter, in chapter 6, Jesus tells us, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. You see, in both verses, we can see that we cannot really separate love from forgiveness. Okay. You cannot mention Eve without mentioning Adam. They go together. Just like love and forgiveness, they are intricately connected, woven together. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 6 tells us, love takes no pleasure in evil, but rejoices in truth. You see, the older son, he doesn't want to rejoice with his father for having his brother back in their arms. Now, through the words of the son, impliedly, he would rather see his younger brother suffer for the misdeeds, for his misdeeds, rather than given a feast, be celebrated upon, and to come to the feast and celebrate with him. He would rather see his brother suffer. And it reminds again of Jonah. He would rather see the people of Nineveh suffered or suffer for their treatment to the people of Israelites. But God said no. Now we see how God is forgiving, how God is so loving to us. 
And again, the older son didn't see the love, didn't see the forgiveness, didn't see the character of his father. The son, it was unacceptable for him and he would not participate in any of it. That's why he stayed out. The parable depicted how those Pharisees treated the sinners. They despised the sinners and they did not welcome them. They were so focused on themselves. They were so focused on their obedience, their adherence to the law and traditions that they did not see the law of grace by God through Jesus Christ. They did not see that all of us are sinners, that all of us had fallen from grace, and therefore that all of them needed God, all of us. And just like the older son, he was focused on himself. The Pharisees were focused on themselves, their own self-righteousness. The son was so focused upon himself. When he was talking to his father, now you can see the words of the son. It was all about him. He said, I have been, I have been slaving for you. I have been obedient with you. Yet you never gave me goats that I should celebrate with my friends. So it's all about him when he was talking to his father. He was so consumed with two things. The older son. He was so consumed with two things. Number one, to see the punishment, to see the punishment served by his father to his younger brother. He was waiting for it. Number two, he was so consumed to get a reward from his father for his good conduct. Now with those things in his mind, with those things boiling inside him, consuming him, it's all about me, myself, and I. I would rather see my younger brother suffer than see him coming back and having a feast than to celebrate. I would rather see him suffer. I would rather see myself receive because I have been obedient to you, my father. See, it's all about himself. He failed to see what? He failed to see the value of his brother, his own flesh and blood. And he failed to see the value of his father. He failed to see the character of his father, loving, forgiving, and caring father. He didn't see those things because he was so consumed by himself, by his own self-righteousness. You see, he would rather have a feast and joy with his friends than with his own flesh and blood, with his own brother and with his own friends. Or with his own father, I mean, you see. Now, these self-righteous people believe that their so-called moral behavior should be celebrated, not the sinners who repent. Now, despite the older, the older son's knowledge of his benefits, we, we mentioned about him being the firstborn with the, with the birthright. And having known of the benefits of being the firstborn, you know, a greater share of the estate, soon to be patriarch in the family, and all other things, his self-righteous mind, his self-righteous mind kept him from seeing the most important thing, the love of his father. He never realizes that if what had happened to his brother happened to him, his father would have treated him the same way. He would, the father would have treated him the same way. The father would have given him also a feast. See? And the wealth for the father, it was nothing. It was nothing to the father. Son, you are always with me. And the father said, and all that is mine is yours. The father didn't care about his wealth. It's yours. It is yours. The most important thing for the father was the life of his two boys. His very own. 
That's what's the most important thing to him. He didn't care about the wealth. You can have it. It is all yours. I would rather have my own son back and lose my own wealth. All my wealth. You can have it. The bus, but the most important thing to the father is his two boys. He was glad that his son, who was dead, was now alive, was lost, and now was found. Now the older son, he didn't see it. And he would not rejoice because of the three temptations that is mentioned in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. It was all present to this older son. The pride of life. In 1 John 2, 16, it says the pride of life. The son said, I have done no wrong. I have done you no wrong. I enslaved myself for you. Pride of life. The last of the eyes. You have not given me a goat. You have not given me anything. The last of the eyes. And the last of the flesh. So I could enjoy and celebrate with my friends. Those were the words of the older son. So all of the three temptations were present in the older son. If you would read First John chapter 2, verse 16. The loss of the eyes, the loss of the flesh, and the pride of life. You see, Satan, he had hardened the heart of this older son. Not to heed his father. And the father went to the feast. And celebrated with his younger son. So the older brother, he remained outside. He remained outside, you know, nursing his pride and resentment. See? Instead of forgiveness and love. He was nursing his anger. He was nursing his jealousy. Now, the question now is, who was really the lost son? Was it the younger son who returned home? Or was it the older brother who stayed with his father, but right now stayed outside of the house, nursing his anger, his resentment, his jealousy? Who is now the lost son? 100% I would agree and I would guarantee that when the older son comes to his right senses, embraces his father, love his father, and embraces his younger son, love his younger son, I do believe that there would be a big feast. There would be a big festival. Do you agree? Amen. Now, let me leave all of us with this final thought. In Ezekiel chapter 18, 21, 23, 25, and 32. But if the wicked man turns from all the sins he has committed, he will surely live. He will not die. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Wouldn't I prefer that he turn from his ways and live? Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. Is it my way that is unjust? Is it not your ways that are unjust? For I take no pleasure in anyone's death, declares the Lord God. So repent and live. My brothers and sisters and friends and those who are joining us in Zoom and in Facebook Live, the gospel is yours. And I would like to call upon those who have not yet accepted the Lord. You have a loving and you have a forgiving Father in heaven. So why not come today, repent of your sins, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And have a wonderful feast with the Lord. God bless all of you. Shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation. Good morning.